All righty, guys. Good afternoon and welcome back. You made it. This is it, the final session, C3 2017. Some fantastic presentations, again, a lot of great content. And uh, I am absolutely delighted to be back with the uh, final panel of the day. Um, I was just taking a look at the uh, title and abstract for this particular uh, panel, for this particular session. Man, that is a long abstract. And then I realized that I'd actually cut and pasted it from a chapter in the new book that I'm writing. <laughs> Absolutely plagiarized myself. Um, there is a lot of conversation going on uh, at this time about speech and talking to uh, your various devices. So we're going to cover quite a lot of that. Uh, first thing that I have to say is that uh, you may know that, uh, or may notice that there is a slight change in the, uh, the lineup. Um, two of our uh, panelists, unfortunately. Oh, wow, that was a quick change, yeah. Um, I wasn't even looking at that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Colin from uh, Forrester uh, dropped a note this morning saying that he was trapped in San Francisco, I believe, on his way back. And uh, 30 minutes later, we had Jeff from Microsoft who had exactly the same problem. Um, I'm not insinuating that they were traveling together at all, but <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> neither of them could make it. Uh, however, I was able to wander out into the street and drag in these two guys, whoever they are, <laughs> and bring them along. So. Let's get right down to it. We'll start with some introductions. Nobody knows these guys better than they know themselves, so <laughs> they can explain who they are. Time-honored tradition, we'll start with Angie, though. Angie, who are you? What do you Thank do, and you. why are you here? I'm Angie Benamati, and I'm here with Stanley Black & Decker. So I brought a good team. Anybody out there in the audience? There's seven, eight of us. Hello, hello. Um, been doing search marketing since 2001. I'm excited about this new era. Some cool things coming. Very cool. Pat. Hey, everyone. I'm Pat Reinhardt. I am the Senior Director of Digital Strategies here at Conductor, so I lead our strategy team. I've been doing SEO for about 13 years. I uh, was a customer of Conductor before I came over here about two years ago to help build out the professional services team. Very cool. And I think we may have seen you before, but <laughs> remind us again who you are. Well, I was on a tour bus during the tour of New York, the and they said we were coming too. to the Oscars. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm looking for like some famous people in the front row. I can He's just looking with. to buy a burger, and we dragged him in here. Uh, Crispin Sheridan from SAP. Um, I manage SEO, um, and we're really considering renaming it at the moment because it's corporate keyword management. Because SEO may be one element of using that, but it's really practical and necessary across the entire um, marketing activity and really persona of the company, plus cross-channel digital attribution. So it's kind of funny, I mean, uh, just to go off at a tangent for uh, one second, I, I mentioned this morning because I've been in the industry for such a long time, I mean, way back at the very beginning before this industry had a, had a title. I, I think it, originally we started calling it search engine positioning. Um, uh, eventually, and then they came up with this idea of calling it search engine optimization. And I, and I always thought that was such a dumbass thing to call ourselves. I mean, I've been in the industry for 20 years. I've never met anybody who's optimized a search engine. Seriously. <laughs> and then we did the search. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, and then we did search engine marketing. I don't know anybody who markets search engines except search engines. Uh, n n nonetheless, we're moving into a new era, so uh, <laughs> if you have a new name for what we're about to get into next, then go ahead. I, I want to give you guys a heads up. Um, so we need to have all of you guys um, interacting as much as we possibly can. I want to get some feedback from you because we've talked a lot about where we've been in search, where we are right now, and of course now we're talking about where we're going. So uh, any information, any feedback that we can share towards the end of this session. But I really wanted to start and think about, because we were laughing before, just thinking about some of our own experiences, and we'll go back uh, to, uh, to some of that in a second. Um, but I want, to, I want you to think about some of the experiences that you've had trying to get used to this whole speech thing and talking to devices. What was the weirdest result that you ever got when you did a search or what's the most bizarre conversation that you ever had with uh, one of these uh, digital assistants with, uh, with a Cortana or Siri or whatever the person over at Google is? Um, and keep it clean. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> On that particular subject, so, uh, you know, we, we've spent all of this time as search engine optimizers optimizing around text documents and keywords and that kind of thing. In the uh, title and the description that I wrote, I said that um, in the early days, uh, the main problem that search engines had was solving the problem with these very short queries, two-word queries, three-word queries kind of thing. Then they started to get longer. Now we're having these lengthy conversations. It's not really just a quick word. 
um, with these uh, digital assistants. Um, I, I want to expand a little bit on that. And part of this new book that I'm writing, I actually talk about concierge search and the difference between uh, actually getting a service from a digital assistant as opposed to uh, just search, and we'll break that down. But um, I was at your apartment recently for uh, brunch with a, a bunch of people around. You have three Alexa devices, I think, at least. Tell us a little bit about the experience of getting used to Alexa and talking to yourself walking around the house. <laughs> Um, well, I do. Um, I'm def definitely quite a bit of an a early adopter nerd. Um, and when Alexa came out, I ordered the original Echo, the larger one, then the little dot, because I wanted to tie it into my sound system that does half the house. And then I got the tap, which is basically a portable one you can take to the beach, but you have to push the button because I guess they're assuming that, you know, with 50 people on the beach, if everyone says, hey, Alexa, play this, every single speaker on the beach will start playing the same song. Um, so uh, between any Echo or Alexa device, other than uh, Tap, you can give them one of two names, which is Alexa or Echo. And obviously no one's got one, otherwise someone would be saying right now, excuse me, I didn't hear that. Um, but when you're sitting in the living room talking to someone about it, and you say, yo, I've, well, I've got my Alexa, and you wouldn't believe what it's done. And Alexa says, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> said, oh, yes, she's over here. Um, but you can't give them any other name. And I think that's actually one of the sort of early branding techniques. I think it might fall out of favor at some point in the future. Um, but the challenge, certainly early on, was both had the same name. And, and the thing that really bugs me is I wanted a, something more like a Sonos, where I could have the same music playing in the living room, the bathroom, the bedroom, the kitchen without having to spend two or three thousand dollars on Sonos, so I put an Alexa in one room and then the uh, tap in the other and connected it into that sound system. Then I asked for the same piece of music or even um, the same artist and, and nothing matched up. Like it's all off by a fraction <laughs> of a second and literally this was happening at a party and people were like, what the heck's wrong with your music? You know, you're supposed to be a techie. Um, but my biggest successes have been around the connectivity with the Hue lights, the Philips Hue. Anyone have Philips Hue lights? Um, I went to a friend's place recently and he had one, one bulb. And I said, what, what's the point in having one bulb? And he said, well, how many have you got? I'm like 28. <laughs> Every single light source in my apartment is a Philips Hue bulb, whether it's the LED strips, the spots, the GU10s, um, and the, I'm, I don't know I'm going on a bit about this, but, <laughs> but the, the challenge that they need to get over is multiple compound requests. Uh, I literally lie down at night and I say, Alexa, turn all the lights off. They all go off. Okay, turn on the bedroom left light, goes on. Turn on my nighttime music, goes on. Put it on loop mode. Now it's on loop mode. Set a sleep timer for 25 minutes. And it's, now it's 25 minutes later and I should be asleep. But you have to do all that separately. There's no ability to do a compound search. So there have been early challenges, but it's kind of fun. And when people come over, they're generally still amazed. <laughs> you say what all I was, of leaning, that I was leaning in there. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Pat. To say all of that. I'm going to just record it and put it on my iPhone. <laughs> By the say, time he's finished yeah. giving Alexa all of these instructions, it's daylight, it's morning, you know? Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to give everybody in the room his address so you never end up being his neighbor because that's kind of going to be a nightmare, I'm sure. <laughs> what are you going to say, Pat? I mean, your early experience with either in search or just generally. Yeah. Speaking to uh, digital assistants. For me, it's the it's incredible by um, it's incredible how much it's being adopted by younger folks, right? So, and I mean younger, younger folks. So my son Jameson, he's four and a half. Uh, he's four and a half, right? And he he knows how to use an iPad. Like it amazes me, you know how how, how well he does with iPads, iPhones, and everything. And he learned how to use Siri. Um, you know, I didn't teach him. I didn't tell him. So he pressed something, he figured it out, and it came up, and he figured out that he could, you know, that he could talk to it. And he's four and a half. So, you know, and around this, you know, uh, you know, a couple of months ago while he was doing this, you know, he's, you know, very vivacious and has, you know, and everything. So he, I remember he, he got really pissed one day. He got really mad at my wife and I, and he just walks over and he's like, you know, stomping around and he goes over to his iPad. He presses the button and goes, Siri, I'm frustrated, right? <laughs> and so, and I'm like, and I'm, I'm like, are you serious, dude? And then all of a sudden she goes, I'm sorry. And then provides results for stress relievers, <laughs> you know? 
and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, but, you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know what? And, and you think about it, and I saw this study that, you know, and that's what Google's challenge is going to be, right? Is the younger people coming up, um, you know, who are using voice search through, you know, through Echo, through Siri, through whatever, because that's really where their next big competition is, is that voice search. And that's how Amazon is going to start to creep into the search space, which they already are for oh, the younger yeah, folks. Oh, yeah, they're already in. It's but crazy. It, it is amazing. I have uh, six grandchildren believe it or not, and I, I just hear from uh, the kids when they're explaining to me about what the grandchildren are doing, and they've reached a point now where they think they can just, so they're talking to the microwave, anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they think everything's touch screen. Exactly. Right. Early experiences with digital assistants, Angie. Well, well I, to build on what we've got going here, I, I go back to what you say about um, the concierge type search, right? So that you, there's this distinction, right, between um, our devices working by voice activation and then there's voice search. So, so much of what we're seeing right now is, is just um, information retrieval, help, help me get some facts, help me. And that's the expectation that I think I have for the most part with, with my home. And my devices, and and when you bring up you know four, five, eight year olds, it's going to be completely different. So, where the machine learning and where the AI goes from here, it it it's going to be really cool. But uh, the statistic of 50 percent by 2020, I wonder like in this audience, for example, who thinks they're already at 50 percent voice search? Anybody using voice search quite a bit? No. Pretty good. Yeah, there's a few out there, so maybe it is 50 50. I guess I'm a glasses half full kind of girl because I'm hoping it's sooner than that. I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm really ready to see the challenge and I think it'll be exciting. So, so looking at it from a, an industry point of view now, I mean, from a, we've all had our own personal experiences and we'll get some more from the, uh, the audience as we go along. Um, I mean, I, I kind of look at it uh, having been in the industry for a long time and understand um, from an agency point of view working with a client what it is that we provide um, uh, the, the excellent service that we provide <laughs> um, to uh, to the client, but we've kind of been sort of uh, human middleware, you know, if you know what I mean, between the uh, the client and the search engine, solving all of those problems based around text. Um, I, you know, I, I wonder sometimes, as an agency, when we get beyond the 50%, what it is with, that needs to change in services and what it is that we provide for a, a client. But let's just go to uh, the the brand first of all. I think. Didn't you have a slide this morning that said that you were sort of 25% or something? I know that Google, generally speaking, is at around 25% uh, speech. And how are you handling those, and, and, and what's the general feel within the, within the company? Sure. So apologies to anyone who was in Mike and my session earlier today. Um, but the, the answer for us in the short term is, is uh, the answer box. Uh, so people who are answering, asking simple questions, particularly by voice, uh, like what is CRM, what is cloud computing, uh, what is SAP S4 HANA. Uh, as long as we have the answer to that and it ranks well and it, we can get it into the answer box, that is what will be read out if it's a voice response. So we're focusing on that for the early uh, C stage keywords and we're looking at the highest volume uh, what is questions that relate to our business and where we have so to, so to call a striking distance. Uh, to get into that answer box because uh, you don't want to spend all your effort if you're unlikely to get up to position you know, close to one or two uh, and therefore have a chance of being what is spoken. Andrew, are you noticing anything at Stanley Black and Decker that there is a major difference between the kind of query that somebody would speak to into a device or compared to what they would just type into the box? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly def definitely a difference in the query. Um, to build off of what you're saying, I mean, you think we build products. So one of the most important things and, and things that I talk about quite a bit are, are microdata, right? We all need microdata, and particularly for products. A fail for us would be someone, you know, asking uh, about the best tape measure, who has the best standout, and that not being marked up correctly. So one of our competitors shows when, in fact, we're actually the best match. We really are the leader in, in the market. So um, that's a quick win, something you can do right now. I think it's important for all the information retrieval that's happening. Pat, you'll probably get access to various amounts of data, like as we do as an agency working with clients, so we get to, to look around. Do you see that there's a huge difference between what somebody will actually speak into a device compared to what they would do 
just typing keywords in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting these days because I think a lot of people are fascinated by the answer box. You know, it's a big question that I get on a weekly, you know, daily basis. Like, what should I be doing here? What should I be doing here? And I think the challenge is, is kind of, you know, the reporting on that and what, what should we be focusing on instead of just kind of casting the net as wide as possible, right? It's not all about like, hey, I want to answer every question that I possibly can answer, right? I want to answer the right questions, right? And so figuring out that data, I, I don't think that people, like, people can type in and, you know, you know, how do I, you know, how do I fix my t my living room table or something like that? If it cracked, right? You know, I think people will say that and they will type that too. We see that a lot of people do the how to, how do I DIY type things. Um, but for the most part, I think that it's really about honing in and figuring out what's right for that particular customer. And to your point, that you are the best match, but you want to make sure that you're spending the time working on that area where you're the best match and not on another area where you're only kind of a good match. And I think that's where you know I'm most interested in is is making making sure that folks are targeting the right areas and the right data. So I, I mentioned uh, in the session that I was doing with uh, Crispin this morning the importance of uh, creating a content experience, not just something that is relevant, but creating content that creates the right kind of experience in that moment, and therefore it has to be useful, you know? Um, and of course, I'm doing a lot of research at the moment. One of the things that I find a little frustrating, actually, that happens uh, so often in the industry when we talk about Google answering questions. We haven't re yet reached, Google hasn't yet reached a stage where it can specifically answer questions. And that kind of limits the kind of content that you can create. What I mean by that is uh, there is a difference between giving a response um, for uh, what is actually a factoid as opposed to just giving a response to a question which requires some thought. So I mean, for instance, um, the way that Google works now, they've become really, really clever at, uh, with deep learning and creating these um, kind of really complex uh, neural networks where they can actually predict what the next thing is going to be anyway. So, you know, you ask, um, you know, how tall is Justin Bieber? I have no idea why that came into my head because I never listened to Justin <laughs> That's an Bieber. interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> Must be one of the grandchildren or something, I'm sure. Um, you know, the next one is where does he live? When was he born? Those kind of things. These are things that never change. So, you know, everybody now is racing for the answer box because these are factoids that are going to get pulled out of Wikipedia or somewhere else. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. I mean, I, I kind of explained um, that we haven't reached the point when you think that you're asking Google a question, that if you were to ask something that was morally based, that you would get an answer because that requires thought. And I was talking to Angie about this just the other day, and I was saying, you know, it's all right saying how tall is Justin Bieber, uh, but try asking, uh, you know, Google, is it morally okay for my teenage daughter to take the morning after birth pill? Google's going to say, ask me another one about Justin Bieber, you know, because it doesn't have, <laughs> doesn't have an answer for that. Um, do you think it is just uh, now that we're talking about search um, and, and given that you've already mentioned that's what you're targeting, are we all now going to be racing to the top? Everybody's fighting for the number one spot in the answer boxes? Well, who remembers or still uses Wolfram Alpha? Anyone? Um, this was supposed to be the answer engine. Uh, and the, the tout was really that the response you'll get doesn't sit today on a web page somewhere. It is a calculation engine. So you can say, you can type it into Wolfram Alpha, and if it gets voice enabled, I don't know if it, maybe anyone knows if it is or not, but you could say, how old uh, will Barack Obama be on the date of you know, February 24th of the next inauguration? Um, and it knows the two dates, and it will make a calculation. That's a factoid. Factoid. So yeah, I mean, so, so the, you, you can do that. <laughs> So I, I want to take a look at something else for a moment as well, because one of the, the, the major changes that we're going to see, I mean, we understand from an a organic point of view, an SEO point of view, what the challenges are, particularly when it comes down to the, the question thing. Everything's about trying to get the answer for the question. But something else that I was thinking about, you know, when Google first started, they didn't have a business model. They weren't quite sure how they were going to make money and eventually came across this thing called pay-per-click advertising, which had been started by somebody else, by the way. That was a go-to, but they kind of uh, stole that whole uh, idea. Um, so, they, so, they, so they built the whole... Uh, they did. So they, so they built the whole business around people sitting with this like huge format kind of big thing called a mouse and a keyboard and a huge monitor in front of you and you type some words in and then you see some ads and you go and click on them. And yet 
25% of the time what they're saying is you're not actually even using the monitor now. So, you know, they call it the, the dark internet or the dark web or the black web, whatever it is, which basically means that if you are driving and you're using a digital assistant like Siri, then the screen is not playing that role anymore. If there's nothing to click, <laughs> how is Google going to make money, do you think? Well, maybe Siri will just ask, hey, this, this will cost you five cents if you want the answer. <laughs> and then you have to confirm. I, Moving I, on, I, Angie. Yeah. Well, it's a game changer, right? So what's going to be really powerful is not just a company that understands search query intent, but someone that really knows about me and knows my behaviors and, and, and has all of that insight. So I think, I think it's a bit of a game changer. I think it's one of these things where it may, like, Google may become an affiliate, right? So if you say, hey, Siri, book me a flight, and they book a flight, then Google will take a piece so, of that. So now you're on to something, because I did notice, actually, that, because um, I use OpenTable quite a lot. Um, uh, my, uh, my wife is traveling a lot, and there are two things in life that I hate the most. The first is my own company, and the second is my own cooking. So staying in for me is not a great idea. So I, I use OpenTable quite a lot. Um, and to go back to the notion of what's the difference between search and service, the concierge side, if I ask Siri to book a table for me, I don't want Siri to go to Google to a browser to perform a search. I want Google to go to the Open Table app and book the table so I get the points, so I, I, so I get it that way. But I did notice that in some local searches now, particularly when you're looking for restaurants, it definitely appears that Google is moving towards the transaction space. So is that a possibility? I mean, is, is Google about to become the world's biggest affiliate marketer, do you think? Um, well, I think first, um, Alexa will become Amazon's uh, next biggest source of revenue because uh, not only do I turn my lights on and off um, with frequently, frequently <laughs> um, with, uh, with Alexa and Hugh, <clears throat> but also uh, I think the thing I use the most is the shopping list. I'll open the fridge and say, Echo, add eggs to the shopping list. I've added eggs to your shopping list. Mind you, with my accent, I do get some funny things when I get to the store, and I'm like, what the heck did I mean when I re read that? Because it'll say, like, white paint, and, and I'm like, white paint? Um, and uh, however, if there's something I previously bought on Amazon, uh, it will say, would you like to reorder it? I can say, Alexa, reorder garbage bags. Last time you ordered 13-gallon garbage bags, it's a pack of 50 for 13 bucks. Would you like me to order it? Yes, please. It shows up the next morning at my apartment. So if you think about this from a commercial point of view, um, in pure e-commerce terms, um, I guess for the first time really, Amazon is a big threat to, uh, to Google. I mean, there's a, the, a possibility there that, uh, and again, from a, a, a favoritism point of view, maybe as if the service seems to be better over at Amazon, you're quite happy to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, Amazon is a search engine, yeah? And I think there's a first starter advantage element to this as well. Um, I don't have the Google Home, I think you said you, you did, but one of you did, yeah? I do. Yeah. Um, so you may stick with it, just like that guy's going to stick with his arm and hammer detergent till he dies. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> if, for the guy who searched on how do I do my laundry. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I mean, I think you, you will maybe def develop an affinity, but um, it'll be interesting, too, to see in the years how much, I mean, we're all human beings, so I, I love to think about this from a cultural point of view, and, and we're people, right? And, and it's a big world, and so, you know, dialect and um, language, you know, Asia, for example, will, will leapfrog, right, when it comes to voice search, because it just makes sense, because the characters that you'd have to type and things. Uh, I'm in, based in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and you get outside the perimeter of Atlanta, and it's interesting to watch some people with really thick southern accents try to use voice search. It doesn't work so well for them. So, so that will be very interesting. Um, but I also wonder, from a cultural perspective, how much we as human beings need a thing to talk to, because um, Siri's been built in inside the Apple uh, TV for a long time, right? But I don't think people talk to Siri in it because you, it, you didn't feel like you had this thing, this person to talk to. It's kind um, of a weird thing, sorry, because we didn't touch on this. Uh, I mean, I, I have kind of trained Siri, so I've used Siri a little bit on my iPhone. In fact, I actually started with Siri asking her if she loved me. <laughs> and at first when... <laughs> I know, I'm a sad guy. 
How long's the wife been travelling for? <laughs> But at first, she couldn't give me an answer. You used to just get a little text thing that used to say, I am not capable of love. This is at the, at, at the, at the very beginning. <laughs> but, but, a, but a little while ago, when I was sitting at home crying because my wife wasn't there and thinking, how am I going to eat? <laughs> I asked Siri if she loved me, and, and she actually said, could I just respect you, Mike? <laughs> we had such a cosy night together, you know. <laughs> There are the, the cultural thing is interesting though. Yeah. Talking to uh, in talking to uh, devices, uh, but there is the actual genuine human capacity um, to remember things and think about this. We're used to uh, ranking and sorting. I mentioned it before. That's what we're used to seeing when we do a search at a search engine. You get a bunch of results, different file types, formats, those kind of things. And I can go back and I can check them. Um, but what if it's a fairly complicated question? What if I'm driving and it's directions or something like that? And the answer is a long answer and I just can't remember it. What if there are five alternatives? You know, I can't be looking at a screen. Um, you know, part of the research that I was doing, because I remember this from uh, back in 2001, there was an engineer, the senior engineer at uh, Google. Her name was Monica Hensinger. And uh, she was a German and her husband worked for BMW. And because of that connection, Google had already started talking to BMW about putting search, voice-based search, into their 7 Series cars. This is like 16, 17 years ago that we're uh, talking about. Um, and they spent so much money on the research, and speech recognition technology has been around for quite some time. Um, but the result that you would get if you asked the question was on a monitor on the dashboard. You know, right. I mean, I'm just checking the results over a cliff. That's the end of <laughs> that's the end of that. So, again, just thinking about it from the human interaction point of view, how, how do you think we're going to get the most satisfactory results or responses, or is it just going to be? How tall is Justin right. Bieber? Right, and, and what will we click on, right? Going back to the search, search results, what will we click on? So will, will it be that we get additional results sent to us by text or something that we look at later? Or, or do we sit there and continually go, nope, next, not that one, next, another okay. one? I mean, I think it's going to be that it's going to become in, an increasing part of our lives, right? You know what I mean? They're gonna, it's going to learn about us. So I think those answers at first will be the just, you know, how, how tall Justin Bieber is. But then ultimately, this technology, as it, as it already is, is getting more and more human, right? And it's going to learn about us. It's going to learn when we need to be reminded about things. It's going to, you know, tell us, you know, and treat, you know, it's going to treat like all the e-commerce stores, you know, to impulse buys. Like, you know, this is the worst thing for an impulse buyer. It's like, hey, you know, hey, you know, Echo, buy me, you know, buy me this. You know, it's just like, oh God, you can just call out into space and then it, it comes. So I think over time, I, th I think it's just going to become part of our lives. And to your point about the cultural thing, people are going to allow that to happen. You know what I mean? I think I think it's just going to become part of our culture. I think my kids are going to have, you know, are going to have a, a, a watch that they're just going to talk. It's going to have a name. It's going to talk to them. It's going to tell them when they got to go to school. Tell them when they got to get up. I, I truly believe that that's what's going to happen. I mean, there are, there, are, there are always going to be occasions where there are certain types of searches that you don't want to be doing in public. You know, I mean, talking into this, and there are certain things you probably don't want people to hear. That, that makes me think, actually, because I'm going off at attention, the number of times that I've been in the men's restroom and there's somebody in the stall and they're sitting there talking to their wife, you know, in the restroom. <laughs> telling their wife they love them. I've got his undergarments around his ankles at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. Ugh, get that right out of here. <laughs> um, when and where, from a cultural point of view, are you going to be talking into uh, this particular device? I think you're absolutely right, though. In fact, there is so much research that says that the more that the device or the concierge, the digital assistant, whatever you want to call it, gets to understand the more about you, the more likely that digital assistant is to provide information before you even ask for it. Mm -hmm. So again, without being the prophet of doom for Google and search engines, that's probably even less searches to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I mean, do you see that and that difference between... I mean, at this point in time, um, I, I have to explain this qu quite a lot because sometimes people still can't get their head around the fact that the internet and the World Wide Web are two different things. And, and Google is king of the web. But even now, with your mobile device, 
you can spend an entire day on the internet without going anywhere near the World Wide Web. You didn't right. need to open the browser, the browser and do a search. Yeah, you just went through, you know, it was Facebook and cloud services and email and, and all of that kind of thing. So um, I think probably now we're spending about 60% of the time with the mobile device purely internet-based as opposed to, uh, to going into a, a, a browser. So um, the way that we interact with the devices and the kind of services that we get, there is going to be a huge race, I think, between, I mean, what do we have? We have like five major kind of digital assistants, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that comes to mind for me is um, when we're talking about these walled gardens um, that uh, are accessible now through some of these uh, audio activated devices and in the case of Alexa um, there are these skills and I try to figure out when I first got my Alexa why do I have to enable skill X, skill Y, one of them I think is the Wolfram Alpha skill and then it dawned on me um, there are now, it's like the App Store, remember when the App Store first came out, first Apple device came out and there were like a hundred apps you're like well why don't they just put all hundred on the phone in the first place what would happen if they did that now? Um, would you like seven million apps on your phone? <laughs> uh, and, they, and they can't take your voice command and say, let's put it through the now 30,000 skills and try and figure out what it is you're actually asking for. So the 20, 30, 50 apps or skills that you use the most, like OpenTable, I can say, Alexa, book me a, book me a table at Salinas for dinner tonight at 8 o'clock. I can say, Alexa, call me an Uber. Um, You're an Uber. <laughs> I've got a funny one about that actually, because because I was trying to, I was explaining the Alexa to someone once, and uh, I said, Alexa, um, call me baby, and she said, okay, baby, and I left it and forgot about it, and uh, a friend was over recently, you know, after that, um, and said, uh, ooh. Can you order like bleach or, or condoms or something? And, and the answer was yes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you have around last night? <laughs> so um, we've got uh, five minutes or so, perhaps just a little bit more left to, um, to have a little jump into the audience here. I'm sure that you're all sitting there with burning questions for our panel of experts. It's very hard to say that. Oh, yeah, we have somebody right over here. I think we've got somebody with a microphone here, actually, if we could just whoosh that down to you so that everybody in the room can hear. No? It was, ah, a, there it was a bottle of water, I think. <laughs> that's right. No, that's a bottle I don't of know, water. I was going to try to use my opera voice for a second. Um, I keep hearing Google mentioned a lot, uh, but Bing actually powers Siri and Alexa both. Um, how do we as independent companies prepare for this voice search when the primary thing we've been targeting, which is Google, is not possibly going to be the main player in the future. So yeah, you're absolutely right to begin with. There is a tendency always to talk about Google because it has been kind of the, you know, the, big, uh, the, the big presence uh, out there. Um, but I think we kind of just touched on that a little bit, just looking at the, um, the, the small field of players that they have out there to begin with. Um, I mean, a lot of it maybe come down to uh, branding. I don't know, but if I was Google, certainly I'd be worried um, looking at the technology, as we've already touched on, that the more that your, um, the more that your, I wouldn't use the word information provider, can, can satisfy that information need, the less you may need to go searching for it, you know? And, and I think it goes back to the theme of the conference, right? Where we've been talking about being authentic in your company's voice you know, knowing who your products serve and, and solving their problems, right? So when you're creating that sort of content and you're thinking less about the tactic, less about the engine, then you're gonna come out on top. Little tweaks here and there and you'll get it right. And I do agree, by the way, Bing is uh, really good. I mean, at the end of the day, you, we, we keep saying Bing, forgetting that's Microsoft, and Microsoft has been in this game for such a long time that a lot of this speech recognition technology, they have been pioneers in anyway. So, you know, they, they, they uh, need the, the props for that. Do we have a question over here? Yes. Ah, hi. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Oh, All right. British accent. That's unusual. Yes, what a surprise. He's got one of um, these microphones. <laughs> So a couple of things. First off, you talked about um, you know who's going to basically interact in the car. I think you see the search engines going after the car tech to basically have self-driving cars going to be consuming and asking questions. So that's one thing. So there's certainly location and context there. 
to your point, actually, Angie, you know, would you, do you think it would just be about being the best to get the best answer? Or do you think it's going to be something like, this is the best answer we found, and these are some other folks you should consider? Because isn't the goal one answer, the best answer? The goal, yeah, right now it is one answer, the best answer, or um, according to Wikipedia, right? We get a lot of according to Wikipedia, according to the New York Times. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes and, and how we'll get multiple results and, and how do you optimize right now to be the best answer. I would say that, you know, it's really important to think about being present in the answer box and really important to think about your markup. In the same way we've known metadata was key. It's and I think that, that that goes to the point, like, as these devices become, it's going to become more personalized over time, right? I mean, like, it's going to be the best answer. It's not, it's going to be, it's the be about the best answer now, according to New York Times. Right. This. Eventually, it's going to be, here's the best answer according to what I know about you, about right. what that device particularly knows about you. And that's what, something we all have to think about, you know, moving into the future, is that it's, it, it's going to get more personalized, just like Google got more personalized. It's just going to get more personalized. So the more that the information provider, to use the term again, knows about you, the more relevant it becomes. Exactly. There, there are two things there. One, I have to say that I was at dinner about 10 years ago with some uh, researchers, scientists, from uh, Yahoo, and one of the Russian guys there uh, posed this question to the table. He said, what if you searched for something and Yahoo just gave you what you wanted? Not 10 blue links, but Yahoo just gave you what you wanted because it knew. And everybody was like, well, that's a bit stupid. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, because they say, what happened to choice? Well, it's your choice, you can decide. But if that information provider knows so much about you personally, your habits, search, everything from search habits to the apps that you use the most, then the likelihood is you're going to get the most satisfactory result, yeah? And I do worry that over time, when we move from requesting facts or even being able to book through walled gardens, etc., that as people try to enable opinion uh, and uh, more objective or less objective type queries and trying to be able to respond to those, those apps or those um, things you've, in, you've enabled will become like your Facebook feed. It will be narrowed down to the sources and you will be cutting yourself off from everything else. So if, you're news, if you say, what do you think of this politician and you've enabled Breitbart, you're going to get a certain answer. And you probably won't have as much exposure to real news as you would hope. So Grant, what's the uh, weirdest experience you've ever had with your mobile device? Keep it clean, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can you use the microphone? Yeah, accents kind of suck. So uh, whenever you get voice <laughs> guidance... Sorry, I, I didn't voice... quite understand what you said there. there you go. <laughs> That's actually good. Now, any kind of voice guidance or anything like that, you have to talk in American accent. So it's like, show all icons for gas stations. You know, <laughs> and my... <laughs> My kids just take insulted the piss everybody so. in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've uh, done it. I've done it. Proud American, funny accent. No, but I mean, it's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, accents are the biggest challenge. There's that great video about the Scotch elevator putting voice activation in the Scotch elevator. Eleven, floor eleven, floor eleven, and they can't do it. If you haven't seen it, look it up. Yeah, but I've seen it. It is the biggest problem, and Siri don't understand me most of the time either. And yeah, whatever. So that's my biggest challenge on my phone. Throwing it against the wall when it doesn't understand me. We've got one minute left, so do we have another question? Anybody have a burning? Oh, yes, we do down here. So my question is, is with, like you guys said, everybody moving to the quote-unquote dark web, not looking at the screen, not having anything to click on, um, these AIs giving us the information that we're requesting, how do us as marketers get that attribution back to our site saying, you know, here's who gave you that answer? Because the search engines at the end of the day crawl our websites and get these answers and serve them up to the end user, but is that, end u or is that website getting that attribution back saying this was where the answer came from? We need an equivalent of a dot tag on the audio <laughs> response, right? <Yeah. laughs> so we can say, bang, it just pinged. That person just listened to one of my responses. Yeah, very good point. I don't know You, you could put on the that. device yeah, on the ground and torture exists, it. Yeah. Where did you get that information from? No more power. You're not being charged ever again. Who are your sources? Actually, that was a, a, a really great session. I just realized we've, uh, we've uh, run out of time. So thank you so much to my panel. They did a great job.
Thank you. Thank you so much to you guys for uh, the job that you did here, for uh, coming along in support. I know for a fact I've heard some uh, great feedback. Uh, you've been great to talk to, great to work with. So give yourselves a round of applause for being a great audience as well.